What's up everyone, this is Frank from Marsman Gaming, and in this video I will be reviewing Dragon's Dogma 2 developed by Capcom. Dragon's Dogma 2 has finally arrived and had taken over the gaming world conversation since its release, earning some strong critic reviews, but also mixed user scores? What the hell happened? How did this game become a controversial topic amongst gamers? With all this heated debate, Marsman had sent me my next assignment, to assemble my pawns and dive into Dragon's Dogma 2. After countless hours, time to submit my report. This is how Dragon's Dogma 2 showed the best and worst of modern gaming. But before we continue with the review, if you like variety gaming content such as reviews, opinion pieces, and streams, make sure to hit that thumbs up and subscribe for future content. Also hit that bell to get notifications. We appreciate your support. And now back to the review. First, let's dive into the good. And before I go into the aspects of the game that really worked for me, and some that may be up there with the best in modern gaming, let me say that I am a noob in the Dragon's Dogma world. I did not play the original Dragon's Dogma or Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. So I I came in with fresh eyes and a towel in hand to sweat through this open world RPG adventure. I will also do my best to avoid major plot spoilers throughout my review. Now the crown jewel of Dragon's Dogma 2, the special sauce that elevates this game, has to be the dynamic world and gameplay that Capcom has cooked up. Now class, if you look up the word dynamic, it characterizes a process or system as constant change, activity, or progress. And that is what the devs of Dragon's Dogma 2 gives you. As the game begins, you are thrust into a vast world after a short prologue showing you some of the basics, going through a couple of fights, and making your main pawn. Then Capcom tells you, alright, see you later. And you must be thinking, you're not going to tell me everything I need to do next? And they tell you, hell no! Go put on your big boy or girl pants and figure this out yourself. This game does not hold your hand. It may not be as unforgiving as Elden Ring, as they do provide you a quest log and details of NPCs you meet throughout your journey, but they truly make you forge your own adventure. This game has two two major kingdoms or regions, with multiple cities in between them. In these cities and in the lands in between are various NPCs and pawns with different personalities and motives. You can also come across 70 different creatures and enemies. The main story takes about 20 hours to complete, and to be honest, isn't anything special. But if you take a step back from rushing through the main object, speaking to NPC, taking some time to do some exploration, this is what makes this a grand adventure. You will find cool treasure and pick up objectives naturally. I will give you a few examples. You could be on a main mission from one city that requires you to travel to another location. On your way out of this new city, you could be stopped by another NPC that desperately asks for your help to find someone missing from the village and was last spotted in a nearby fort. Well damn, that sounds interesting. Let me pause my main objective and help out with this one. As you travel to this new area, you will then suddenly see a group of NPCs fighting a troll or a new cave your pawn spots with potential treasure. Or better yet, two giant monsters fighting each other where you have to have an internal debate whether you want to pick up a box of popcorn and watch these beasts go at it like you're watching a Godzilla movie or get involved to defeat them both. You can be buying supplies at a local store when some monster walks his way into town and you and the town folks must stop him. Maybe you wanted to take a peaceful ride in the ox cart to the next city and enjoy the beautiful environment and holy hell what just happened. Even when you set up camp trying to regain health outside of a city and avoid the dark and creepy nights you run the risk of being attacked. These are actual events that occur to me in my playthrough. There are also various times that I picked up new missions from NPCs who I have passed without a care multiple times, but will now ask for help because of something that has been triggered from a previous mission or decision you made, or because a certain time of the day where this objective needs to take place. I think you get the point. This game by design has created a world that feels full of possibility, enticing exploration, and constant tension. A world that feels alive. The second part of this special sauce that I mentioned earlier Earlier is the dynamic gameplay. Once you get by a pretty in-depth character model creator for both yourself and eventually your main pawn, for which people have made absolute wild designs that I am not nearly as talented enough to do, you also get to choose what vocation you would like your character and main pawn to be. Each vocation has their own strengths, weaknesses, abilities, weapons, and skills. You get access to 10 vocations throughout the game. Four vocations at the start, which are fighter, archer, thief, and mage. Two more advanced vocations you can get access in a couple of hours into the game in Sorcerer and Warrior, and four hybrid vocations only available to your character in the Magic Archer, Mystic Spearhand, Trickster, and Warfare. Now for the gameplay you are seeing throughout my review, it will be limited to the three main vocations I use for my playthrough, which is Fighter, Thief, and Archer. And I believe the decision you make on your vocation can be your make or break one for your enjoyment of the combat of this game. At first, when I started playing the game, I chose a Fighter vocation thinking being 
Young Balance would be a good fit for me. But I didn't like the lack of speed and some of the stiffness my character had. And in the beginning, I was actually getting stale on the game for the first few hours. But then I made a vocation change to a thief, and my eyes were open and my heart full once more. This made me want to try multiple vocations and seeing which style fit me best. And giving that option for players without it being such a grindy process to make a vocation change is a great thing. These vocations, coupled with 12 weapon types, 127 weapons, and 12 shields gives you a lot of options on the playstyle you want to use. It is not just the vocation that makes the gameplay dynamic, but the environment you battle different enemies as well. In Dragon's Dogma 2, there really isn't a designed arena you battle a great deal of your foes. The world is your arena, and the environment can be used as a perk or detriment in your battle. At times, fighting an enemy that can fly, you can jump on and ride that enemy, attacking it on its back, and it can fly you to a whole new area of the map. Or that enemy can throw you and send you to an awful death. Climbing large enemies like a Shadow Colossus game is a real fun mechanic. You can lay traps by destroying a bridge or breaking a dam, sending foes to their deaths, or they could do the same to you. Large enemies can deliver massive strikes that send you flying from your party. There is a variety to the scale of your encounters and game physics that can lead to some memorable or hilarious moments, and this can change from player to player. The combination of the world design and gameplay loop isn't perfect, but the developers took a chance, and boy, it paid off. Having the combination of these components has this game standing, in my opinion, with some of the best open world games we have seen over the last few years. The last aspect I want to address before moving on to our next segment is the pawn system. I won't lie to you, when I heard Dragon's Dogma 2 wouldn't have capabilities to summon any of your buddies to play with you, I was disappointed, and after playing Dragon's Dogma 2, I still haven't changed much of my thoughts on the topic. However, I really did enjoy the pawn system that was implemented. As stated earlier, you get to make a main pawn and choose a vocation for that main pawn that will travel with you throughout your journey. You also get the option to hire up to two additional pawns that are walking around the world or at Riftstones found throughout the game to join your team. Assembling a balanced team that complements you and your main pawn can be very valuable in combat. I really liked leveling up my main pawn and making it enticing for other players to hire them, and vice versa. Although some of you sick monsters gifting forge, golden stove beetles, cedar tokens, and wake stones as gifts for using pawns should die a fiery dragon death. Combat is not the only purpose of the pawn. They help direct you to your objectives on missions, help find new caves, lose their damn minds when finding an unused ladder. Oh I know, they tend to have an issue shutting their mouths, either praising every move you make, or making questionable comments about your preferences. But who doesn't love after a big battle to have your pawn give you a high five? A fist bump or a gentle slap on the ass. Okay, I made up that last part. Just make sure to give your pawns daily eye exams, because if they start glowing and acting weird, you need to take them out. With the good, we have to address the bad. And easily, the number one problem with Dragon's Dogma 2 is... No, not the microtransactions that everyone is losing their minds over, but the performance of this game. The performance for Dragon's Dogma 2 at release was pretty damn bad, and honestly, unacceptable for the talent of this team. Now, I reviewed this game on the Xbox Series X, and won't dive into all the technical terms and reasons for why this game had its issues, for which I suggest you check out Digital Foundry's performance review on this game, but I will give you my experience on what I saw. This game suffers from some wild frame drops, especially in areas where there are NPCs around, which is usually in the city. Outside of the frame rate drops, you will get these laughable NPC pop-ins that happen quite frequently that feels like it's coming from a game from six plus years ago. You do at some moments get rendering issues, but are not as frequent as the other issues I mentioned. The AI for this game is mixed, where at times they are smart, while others completely brain dead. Now the game runs more consistently away from the cities and on console altogether compared to PC, but that doesn't mean it runs well. We also can't ignore the very poor optimization on the PC, leading to the initial mostly negative reviews on Steam. The game also to my knowledge isn't verified on the Steam Deck as it's practically unplayable. I know, I will hear some PC players telling me in the comments how their massively strong rig that can be used at NASA never gave them issues while playing this game, but a hell of a lot of players could not run this game well. I also understand that open world games and games with complex systems tend to have some bugs, but this isn't some bug. There is also no option to adjust motion blur or ray tracing on console. The game does not give you a quality or performance mode. There is only one playable mode, and I know people will say they are working on the performance patches and this game will be better, and I believe that this game performance will improve over time, but we are reviewing a game as it is when it releases, not what it will be. And a reminder, this is a $70 game. It is not the consumer's responsibility to quality test your product at launch of a 
a full price release. This situation has had many examples over the last couple of years, but the most recent one that Dragon's Dogma reminds me of is Jedi Survivor, another very strong game that got overshadowed by its poor performance. Dragon's Dogma 2 feels like another example of an awful trend in modern gaming, where the game is not fully ready and is sold at a premium price, with a promise of patches to fix performance in the future. Now it's time to address the other big topic surrounding this game, and that's the ugly M word, microtransactions. This has been such a strange topic that has led to two different sides yelling at each other. One side saying that the microtransactions are no big deal, everything can be earned in game. Capcom has done this before with Monster Hunter, Devil May Cry, yada yada yada. Then the other side saying that these microtransactions are stupid, are a pay to win, locking off features to the store, and want to send Dragon's Dogma to the Shadow Realm. Now both sides have some valid points, while other points are completely wrong or overblown. Welcome to the gaming community. But two things can be true at once. First, these microtransactions are unbelievably stupid. This game once again is $70 and trying to nickel and dime gamers for stuff you can get in game like rift crystals, wake stones, a port crystal, the ability to change your character appearance for a couple extra bucks is dumb and greedy. I recommend no players waste their money on this. Now we have seen some wild prices and predatory behavior from lots of games. So in comparison, this doesn't seem so awful. But this is coming right off of Capcom winning Metacritic's Publisher of the Year, which shows general greed can infect all our favorite developers and publishers, and we should continue to call them out when they do dumb things, even if we love them. Secondly, the misinformation that has gone around about what exactly is in the store was pretty wild. A lot of talk around Dragon's Dogma was this thought that fast travel was locked away under a paywall. This is a big accusation because the design of fast travel, which I will dive to in a little bit, is a struggle in this game. However, when you actually go into the store, it only sells one port crystal that acts like a flag you plant in an area to travel to. You also need fairy stones to travel to areas with port crystals. So this thought that this one port crystal drastically changes your ability to fast travel in game is completely blown out of proportion. Personally, I thought the selling of rift crystals and wake stones were more egregious. And even then, there is a lot of opportunities to achieve them in game. But this hive mind mentality and jumping on the bandwagon to destroy the game over misinformation and not even bother to correct it from some content creators to countless gamers is also one of the ugly trends that we see in the gaming community today and that should be called out. We all make mistakes but try to check your info before jumping into something. The last aspect of the game that I want to address that just did not click with me is the fast travel or should I say the lack thereof in this game. In Dragon's Dogma 2 they limit your ability to fast travel with even the director of the game saying that games that have fast travel only have it because their game is boring and it doesn't really entice you to explore. Now you can fast travel like I mentioned previously, but it's limited and annoying. The only way to fast travel is to obtain or unlock port crystals at a location and use fairy stones to travel to said port crystals. Or you can ride an ox cart to fast travel from one city to the next. Sounds simple, but port crystals are limited and getting fairy stones can be a bit complicated or expensive if you're purchasing from a merchant. You can also find fairy stones completing some missions in chest or enemies can drop them, but the rate drop is small and if the average player is not exploring the entire map then they will be limited in fairy stones they pick up. Ox carts are cheaper but they show up at a specific time of the day and it doesn't help much outside of going city to city. I know what some might be saying, well the limited fast travel had to entice you to explore the area more right? No it didn't and the biggest fault of this is the mission designs in the game. When you pick up a mission from an NPC it usually requires you to travel to a location far from where the original NPC is to complete the task. Sounds all good. However, to get your full reward for completing that task, they require you to report back to the original NPC who gave you the mission. So you have to backtrack to the original location or continue with the fear of being attacked, your life being degraded, and not collecting. What is also laughable is other big games in the genre like Elden Ring, Legend of Zelda, Skyrim, and plenty more that offer fast travel more easily easily and that didn't take away from the desire to explore in those games. This limited fast travel just feels like a way to be different just to be different and the thought that it provides more incentive to explore is BS. Overall Dragon's Dogma 2 showed positives and negatives. This game developed a dynamic world and gameplay that is enticing to explore, experiment with different vocations, and lose countless hours forming your pawn squad. However the game was clearly not ready at launch with awful performance issues on PC and even 
disappointing performance on console. The microtransactions are stupid and you shouldn't buy them, but the misinformation surrounding the store from the outside of the game is even more stupid. I am giving Dragon's Dogma 2 an 8.5 out of 10 a Marsman Gaming stamp of approval. This game has aspects that can make it stand toe to toe with some of the best in the genre, but the poor performance and the little bit of greed keep this really good game from being an elite one. Thank you everyone for watching. If you haven't done so yet, make sure to hit that thumbs up and subscribe for future content. This is Frank from Marsman Gaming, signing off. Game on.